I'm going to make it even more complex, and I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to epigenetic mechanisms and how we think they might confer vulnerability to pain. First of all, as David said, obviously we all have different uh, DNA sequences, but the DNA does not exist on its own, but it is wrapped up into a complex 3D chromatin architecture that makes up the chromosomes inside our nuclei. And on the way to being wrapped up, the sequence can be modified in various ways. The DNA itself can be methylated, usually at cytosine guanine runs, and it is then coiled tightly around histone proteins that have lysine residues, which can be chemically modified. They can be acetylated, phosphorylated, and methylated. And the nature of these modifications determines how tightly the DNA is wrapped and what kind of transcription factors are being recruited. So ultimately then, DNA methylation and histone modifications together determine which of our genes are being used at any given time. And they're really the two classical epigenetic mechanisms. They are stable and long-term modifications, and they're heritable in dividing cells. Epigenetics is a field of study that really comes from developmental and cancer biology. In the neurosciences, it is a fairly young field, and uh, this comes with some uh, slight difficulties. The literature is still peppered with misconceptions. And I thought I would provide you with three basic facts about epigenetics. And if you remember these three basic facts, I think you'll be able to navigate the literature and also navigate newspaper reports that are usually very um, enthusiastic, maybe slightly over-enthusiastic about the topic. Fact one, epigenetics is crucial for normal development. There is a very uh, well-controlled global round of DNA demethylation early in development during which pluripotency genes are expressed and when the DNA is remethylated, many other epigenetic modifications control the expression um, of developmental genes and ultimately help determine cell differentiation and cell fate. When something goes wrong in this process, you suffer from very serious diseases such as Rett syndrome, Angelman syndrome, and prader willi syndrome. Fact number two, epigenetic modifications are highly cell type specific. This really follows on from the developmental point. Since epigenetics helps determine the fate of a cell, you really, each cell type has its own epigenome. And you see here in this, uh, this is just a visual illustration of this. This is uh, global DNA methylation profiles of different cell types. You see primary cell types clustered together, in vitro derived cell types clustered together. And even within the clusters, you can clearly distinguish between brain cells and heart cells. And just as an example, the Blueprint Consortium, which is tasked with uh, characterizing the epigenome of all cells in blood, requires researchers to submit cells that are 95% pure. So that's what we really have to study to be able to understand epigenetics, pure cells. Fact number three, epigenetic modifications are stable modifications. First of all, most of our DNA is methylated in most tissues. You can see here, 70 to 90% of the sequence is methylated across all these different tissues, with the exception of the placenta. Not only that, but the DNA methylation will stay there and it pretty much won't change. The majority of it won't change over the course of your life. And similarly for histone modifications, most modifications turn over only when the cell turns over and then are inherited into the same state and so remain the same. There are some modifications that are thought to have shorter half-lives, um, but in neurons actually we don't know yet what these are exactly. The current data are from yeast. And I'd like you to take a moment and contrast this with the things that we normally study in the context of pain. 
we tend to study transcription. We say, gene expression has changed in a chronic pain state. Well, transcription can change within a matter of minutes. We say, oh, this protein X is now more highly expressed. Well, most proteins actually turn over within two to four days, maybe a week. There's only very few proteins that stay put for a long time. One of them is the histone protein itself. And of course, we have extracellular matrix proteins such as collagen. Hence, by the way, just an aside, don't waste your money on collagen filler injections. The body doesn't know what to do with the collagen and your wrinkles won't be, go away. All right, why do I want to study epigenetics anyway? Why do we want to study epigenetics in the context of pain? The reason is that when the modifications do vary, in the rare occasions that they do, they vary in places that matter. So this is just a cartoon of a gene. As I said, most of the gene will be methylated. But you have important regions that regulate the expression of the gene. You have the transcriptional start site or promoter, and you have so-called enhancer regions that from far away help regulate whether the gene is expressed or not. So you have transcription factors binding these enhancer and uh, uh, promoter regions. And it's exactly in these regulatory regions that DNA methylation varies between individuals and between conditions. And secondly, the variation in the epigenome seems to increase over time. This is some data uh, collected in monozygotic twins. So remember, monozygotic twins don't just have the same DNA, but they also come from the same zygote, and it's thought that the zygote determines your epigenome. Hence, your clone will never be really the same because it has the same DNA, but it has a different zygote. And you see in three-year-old monozygotic twins, as one would expect, their global DNA methylation and histone acetylation levels are very similar. When you compare this to 50-year-old twins, suddenly you see big changes emerging. So this is suggestive of the fact that what happens to us throughout our lifetimes can have an impact on our epigenome. So really, what's our hypothesis? The hypothesis is that we have our DNA sequence, and as David showed, in the DNA sequence itself already, you may have certain variants that predispose you towards pain. On top of that, you have the epigenome, the epigenome that you're born with, and that already may be different from that of your sister or your neighbor and predispose you towards having certain genes more highly or lowly expressed towards pain. On top of that, um, whoops, you live your life, and bad things happen sometimes. You may have a road accident, which we heard yesterday may increase your risk of chronic pain. You may have to have surgery, hopefully then performed by Henrik, because then you have a much better chance of not uh, developing pain. And these adverse events may change uh, some epigenetic modifications. And because the epigenetic modifications are in important regulatory regions, and because they remain stable over long periods of time, they may then be able to sustain the long-term sensitization that we see in the nociceptive system and that we believe might be responsible for the development of chronic pain. Now, that's the hypothesis. Um, what's the evidence? I'm not going to lie. We don't have evidence to support this beautiful causal chain that I've drawn here. But we have some evidence beginning to emerge that supports that uh, uh, pain perception is influenced by our epigenome. And we also have some evidence that chronic pain can change our epigenome. And I'm going to quickly talk you to through two pieces of evidence that demonstrate this. One is a twin study and one is an animal study. First, the twin study. Here we have again data uh, from the Twins UK unit at King's College London. We're really lucky to be able to collaborate with this amazing research and the uh, resource and the researchers there. This was uh, Tim Spector. Um, uh, Francis Williams, my boss, Steve McMahon, and Jordana Bell, and many other people. They phenotyped 2,000 twin pairs, and they looked at the heat pain threshold, so when does heat start to hurt, and the heat pain super threshold, when does the heat become unbearable. Obviously, these two measures are correlated. And then they picked twin pairs 
where one twin had a very low threshold and the other twin had a very high threshold. So these twins have the same DNA, but they have very different perceptions. So the hypothesis was that maybe what is different is their epigenome. And so Jordana performed genome-wide DNA methylation. And indeed, she found that methylation at a specific gene, the triple one gene that David already mentioned, was correlated, inversely correlated with heat pain sensitivity. So for instance, if you look here more closely, you have one twin with a high heat pain threshold and low DNA methylation, and her sister with a low uh, heat pain threshold and high DNA methylation. So this was really the first evidence that the state of our epigenome is maybe related to how we perceive pain. As with all epigenome-wide methylation studies in the field of neuroscience at the moment, or 99%, the study was conducted in blood. As I said before, cell type specificity is really important. We don't know what this means for the epigenome in neurons. And so, to offset that, uh, Jadana has done something uh, very important. She has validated some of these findings in skin tissue, which is, which is a bit more relevant. She looked at triple one gene expression, and the results were in line with what you would expect. Someone who has a low heat pain threshold had low triple one gene expression, which is what you would expect when you have high methylation and the opposite when you have high heat pain threshold, you have high expression because you have low DNA methylation. So it's a very nice example of what you can do in humans, but what you can't do in humans, you can't study directly the cell types that are involved in the perception and in the, in the, in the development of chronic pain. So for this, we really have to move in an animal model. We looked at spinal cord microglia, mainly because these are the cells that we can extract and isolate and purify currently in sufficient numbers to do this kind of work. You will all know that microglia are very important for the development and maintenance of chronic neuropathic pain, certainly in animals, but also in humans. Uh, fresh imaging data suggests that they're also very important. And we can use novel flow cytometry and flow uh, cell sorting methods to isolate these microglia. This is just an example of what it looks like. I have a marker for monocytes on the x-axis, CD11B, and a special uh, marker made by collaborators in Harvard for resident microglia, the P2Y12 receptor, on the y-axis. And you can see that the immune cells are isolated from the spinal cord of the mice, whether they're injured or regular mice. The vast majority of them are resident microglia, and I can purify them and obtain these 95% pure populations that we really need to look at the epigenome. Why did we want to do this? We wanted to study enhancers. As I mentioned before, enhancers are these regulatory regions that control the expression of genes further downstream. We can identify enhancers by looking at places in the genome where there is a single methyl group at lysine residue 4 of histone 3. It just so happens that when this particular histone mark is present in the genome, you usually find an enhancer region associated with it. And we wanted to study regulatory regions, particularly in immune cells, because it has been shown that in macrophages, which are the peripheral equivalent of microglia, you have a very new and exciting phenomenon. So most regulatory regions in macrophages will be there from birth. Most enhancers will be there from birth. But uh, an Italian group showed that if you apply different inflammatory mediators, such as TNF-alpha, you get a small group of novel enhancers, novel regulatory regions that emerge. And you get, if you apply another inflammatory mediator, like IL-1-beta, you get another group of enhancers that emerges. And if you apply yet another mediator that's functionally quite different, like, say, IL-4, you get a third set of enhancers that emerges, which is quite different from the first two sets. So it seems like that these groups of novel enhancers encode the stimulus that the cell has just encountered. And even more interestingly, some of them stick around even once you remove the stimulus. So it seems that these enhancers, in particular the latent enhancers, are a molecular mechanism by which the cell can remember what it has encountered and then potentially change its transcriptional response to the same stimulus the second time around. Kind of like an immune memory, but um, yeah, like an immune memory. So the question we wanted to ask was, 
Do novel enhancers appear? Do novel regulatory regions appear as a result of a chronic pain state? So to do this, we just took mice. They underwent nerve injury or a sham injury. We left them for seven days. We isolated the microglia. We studied uh, the RNA and the DNA uh, bound by this specific enhancer mark. We sequenced everything. And this gave us a genome-wide and cell-type specific transcriptional profile and enhancer profile that we could then examine. To show you a little bit of the raw data, just to uh, walk you through it slowly, it's a bit busy. We have the gene, a particular gene down here, in fact, the beginning of a gene, CCL12. It's a chemokine, it's algesic, it makes the microglia inflammatory. All those black bits here, these are the enhancers. And the top line, if you look here, this is from a control animal, and the bottom line is from an injured animal, and you have a novel enhancer, a regulatory region here in this um, uh, SNL animal. So the answer to our question was yes, we believe there are novel regulatory regions that appear as a result of this nerve injury. And in fact, when we looked at the genes that were regulated transcriptionally, so we say which genes have increased conscription in microglia as a result of neuropathic pain, we came up with this list of top dysregulated genes, and four of these top dysregulated genes also had novel enhancer genes. Now the next step, obviously, that we want to ask, the next question we want to ask is, uh, are these enhancer peaks functional? Will they contribute to making the pain more chronic? Um, and do they exist in other cell types, other models? In the meantime, though, I think, uh, I hope to have convinced you that epigenetics could be a potential key driver of vulnerability. I think certainly conceptually it's quite an enticing idea. Uh, in terms of the evidence, we can show that uh, our epigenome, your epigenomes, will help co-determine your baseline pain perception. And we also have some evidence that if you are in a chronic pain state or if an animal is in a chronic pain state, changes do happen to epigenetic uh, marks. Uh, we have to overcome many technical challenges in the future to really study this in more detail. One of these challenges is the cell type specificity. Uh, we are going to, together with uh, David, he mentioned these uh, sensory neurons derived from patient-induced pluripotent stem cells. We will be using these to look at uh, the epigenome of uh, sensory neurons in patients. And Effig and Grünenthal has just given us some money to do this, so thank you again for that. I would also really like to thank my supervisor, Stephen McMahon, who has been extremely supportive, and uh, Maggie Crow, who has contributed to some of this work, the Welcome for Center for Human Genetics, who did the sequencing, and uh, our funders, the Welcome Trust, and you for listening. <laughs>